All right, as we're getting back to our seats, we're at 1 Samuel chapter 4. And today we're going to attempt to get through verse 22, but we're going to start with verse 12. What I want to do is just read the first six or seven verses, give a little bit of a recap, and then we'll get into our study. So 1 Samuel chapter 4, beginning with verse 12. It says here, Then a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line the same day, and he came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. Now when he was there, I'm, I'm sorry, when he came, there was Eli sitting on a seat by the wayside, watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, What does the sound of this tumult mean? The man came quickly and told Eli. Eli was 98 years old. His eyes were so dim that he could not see. Then the man said to Eli, I am he who came from the battle and fled today from the battle line. And he said, What happened, my son? So the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has been a great slaughter among the people. Also your two sons, Ophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of, the God, and the ark of God has been captured. Then it happened when, the, when he made mention of the ark of God that Eli fell backward by the side of the gate, and his neck was broken, and he died. For the man was very old and heavy. Sounds like it's describing me. And he judged Israel 40 years. Wow. What we've been looking at up to this point has been the judgment of God that has been coming against the nation of Israel because of their corruption and their disobedience to his word. Remember with me in chapter 2, verse 39, uh, 31, we are told here that the days are coming that I will cut off your arm and your arm of your father's house so that there will be not an old man in your house. That judgment was specifically given to Eli, the priest of Israel. And the function of the priest in those days was to lead people into worship of the Lord. It was when these people would come up once a year, the men of Israel would come up once a year, these priests were appointed by the Lord because they are from the tribe of Levi to carry out the functions of worship to the Lord. They're to carry out the functions of a priest to intercede between God and the people. And these, these priests had a very high respected role in that time. They were the ones that would represent us, the people, when they would make the yearly sacrifices for sin. They were the ones that would have would be able to go into the holies of holies to uh, once a year into the presence of the Lord. They were instructed by the Lord in certain ways in how to conduct their lives. So they were representation of God's people. But he had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, which the Bible tells us they were corrupted wicked men that did not know the Lord. And because of this, as we remember, as they were ripping God off, turning hearts away from the Lord, sleeping with the women that worked in the tabernacle, the men of God or the men of Israel began to turn their hearts away from the Lord. So because of this, God is now pronouncing judgment on Eli and his two sons and the nation of Israel because they turned their backs on God. And so we see here that this is a pretty tragic passage because we're going to see Eli die, as we just seen. We're going to see his grandson pass away. We're also, we also are going to see that his two sons, Eli's two sons are passed away. So we see nothing but death coming into this chapter. And again, it's a reflection of chapter 2, verse 31, where it says, I will cut off your arm. God is saying, no longer will your lineage of being a priest will be in order. Because of your corruption, because of your disobedience, I am going to cut you off in your entire house. 
even to the point where his Eli's daughter-in-law dies as soon as she hears that the ark was captured. And so we're, we're going to take a look a little bit about what's going on. But last week, we took a look that Israel went to battle. And when they went to battle with, with the Philistines for the second time, this time they brought the Ark of the Covenant with them. It's when we talked about the Ark of the Covenant was a representation of God's throne here on earth. It was the, it was the, the, the piece of furniture. I don't want to just minimize that it was just a piece of furniture, but it was a piece that would go into the tabernacle, which is this big tent that had specific utensils in there specifically for worship to the Lord. And it was only the priest that was able to go where this Ark of the Covenant was located, where the presence of God dwelled. And here it was designed itself by God. God gave instructions to men, the Bible says, that he put his spirit into, that he gave them the instructions and in what to create and how to create this Ark of the Covenant. And so they think that they can bring this ark into battle with them as we've seen we discussed this even on Friday night they thought that the solution to beat the Philistines or to have victory over the Philistines was to bring this peace this ark of the covenant into battle when they never ever inquired of the Lord the 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 elders and the and the camp of Israel and the and the military campaign that was arraying themselves in battle missed one important thing they never sought the Lord. And so now they're taking this Ark of the Covenant, never instructed by God, and they're taken into battle as some type of gimmick and good luck charm. Remember with me, when they brought the Ark of the Covenant into the camp, the earth shook. They were so excited. Their solution to have victory over the Philistines was the Ark of the Covenant instead of God. Yes, God Instructed the Ark of the Covenant to be made. He, his presence dwelt between the two cherubs on the Ark of the Covenant. But he never instructed them to take it out to battle. And so according to chapter 4, four verse 2, the first battle that they go into the Philistines with, 4,000 men are killed. Now they bring the Ark of the Covenant in and they're excited and they bring it into battle. Now 30,000 men are killed. In addition to this, the wicked sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, are also killed in the battle. Would we think that the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord would guarantee victory? You know, we talked about a little bit about this last week, how we think that we can have objects that we can bring into our battle, that we battle every day, and think we're going to get victory because maybe God's name's in it. I was jokingly sarcastically saying you know we can think we can go to battle wearing not of this world t-shirt and think we're going to have victory or we think that we can walk around with a cross hanging around our neck which representations of what jesus has done for us and we think we can take that cross into battle and just believe it in that cross alone as a gimmick we think that brings us victory and a lot of times we can go into battle thinking that we can use gimmicks we can use methods, we can use religion to, to be the gimmick or the solution in conquering the enemy. But we only know it's Jesus Christ that brings us the victory. It's our life in him. It's being filled with the Holy Spirit. And here they use the Ark of the Covenant of God as a gimmick for their victory. And there can be a tendency for us to think of the Lord in this way. Like he's at our disposal doing whatever we want for him. Whatever we command from him. And I was sharing Friday night at our men's barbecue. I did the same thing when I would go to jail. I'm in jail, you know, spun out of my mind. And Lord, if you get me out of here, I promise I'll serve you. Lord, I promise if you get me out of here. And as I mentioned to you guys last week, you know, if you've ever been to county jail, your bunks, you feel like you're in a coffin. Because we had bunks of three. And my, it felt like I was in a coffin. And what I would do is I would put a Bible underneath the bunk on top of me so I could just look at it. And I would look to the Bible as for my answers. I wasn't reading it. I was just looking to it. 
I was looking, I was telling myself, I'm looking to God's word. But it's not enough when the Bible is just sitting like this in my bunk and I'm just thinking, you got to get me out of here. And then when I get out of here, I'm thinking, wow, speaking to the Bible, I got out of here. And I use it as a gimmick. The next thing I know, I'm back in jail. Or I'm strung out. Or I'm, a, I'm addicted. And it was a, used as a gimmick. And every time, anytime we go into battle, and we, men, we know what we battle. We battle lust. We battle pride. We battle a lot of different things. We battle anxiety. We battle depression. We battle finances. I mean, the battle's big. It's not just one specific battle. Men, we're in battle every day. But if we think that we can go into battle using gimmicks or using religion or say I go to church on Wednesday nights or, you know, I go to, well, if you come to Tuesday mornings, you guys are already victorious, right? <laughs> Thank you for that. But oftentimes in the, all these battles as men that we face, we think if we do religion or we just come to church, or we just, and, and we don't have that relationship with Christ, or we're not in God's word, then we can go into battle thinking, God's with me. And then we go into battle and we realize we lose 30,000 men. Like, Lord, what happened? I thought you were with me. And so now this battle has taken place. Israel's been defeated even greater. The two sons of Eli are dead. The Ark of the Covenant is now captured. We're going to take a look at it. And so from this, we see in verse 12 that, he, that there was a, that a man of Benjamin. Now remember with me, Israel's divided up into 12 tribes. And each tribe is a son of Jacob. And it was the promises that God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that said, your descendants will be like the star, the stars in the sky and the sand, the grains of the sand. They're going to be multiple people. And when, when, uh, when God instructed Jacob, he gave his sons, the 12 sons, he gave them each land. And when this land, they were instructed to do specific things. And so Benjamin is part of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, what's interesting about Benjamin, because usually when the writer mentions Benjamin, it seems like these details have a little bit of a small consequence. Like, why would they mention Benjamin? There's a reason why the writer here is mentioning the tribe of Benjamin. But before I get into that, this battle that was fought, it tells us in verse 1, was fought near a city called Aphek. When you look at verse 1, it tells us that, that they camped in Ebenezer and the Philistines and camped in Aphek. So it was about 20 miles from Aphek to Shiloh. Shiloh is where the Ark of the Covenant was at. Shiloh is where the priest Eli was at. It was kind of the worship center of that time. And it tells us here in verse 12 that a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line the same day. This man ran about 20 miles. It was a long, it was mostly uphill, and he came with him. He brought with him very bad news. Now the Bible. Biblical writers, when, when they write, it's interesting that when you read the Bible, when, when you look at details that a writer may give us, there, there's a reason why a Bible writer or something we find in the details, there's a reason why writers will use details. And it won't be long before we look at Israel down the road and their hopes will now be pinned at that time to another Benjamite, another people from the tri another person from the tribe of Benjamin. Would you guys know who he is? King Saul. Later on, we will see that. Now, what's interesting about what this who this man is is unidentified. And and uh, 
but according to unfounded, now I want to say unfounded, Jewish tradition. It's not biblical. It's unfounded. I just want to make that clear. That some believe that this unnamed man possibly could have been Saul. But we tell us here in verse 12, the, the writer gives us a description of him. Look what it tells us, that this man ran from the battle line the same day, and he came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. Sounds like he spent time with my kids. <laughs> What's interesting about this is this is more than just a disturbed appearance of, appearance of being involved in battle. This is also a sign of mourning and grieving. He had run all the way from Shiloh, from Aphek to Shiloh. Again, it's about a 20-mile trek. So, of course, he's going to look raggedy. But his clothes torn and the dirt on his head doesn't necessarily mean he was, that was from the battle. More than likely, these were signs of mourning and grief. Would look at him. And you would see that it was plain that he was going to bring bad news. I could only picture him running, probably thirsty, tears streaming down his eyes. And we'd look at him and we're thinking, I don't even want to hear the news that you want to tell me. This was common back in those days when there was bad news. When there was grief or mourning, Joshua chapter 7 Verse 6 tells us, Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord that evening. And he and the elders of Israel, they put dust on their heads. A lot of times when they hear bad news, they would rip their clothes. So this was a picture of grief and mourning. But before we're drawn to him again, our attention is now drawn back to the old man Eli who the Bible tells us here in verse 13 that he was seated by the wayside watching. That's pretty interesting because later on, we're gonna, the, the, later on here, just in this passage, he's gonna tell us that he's blind. And it says here that in verse 13 that when he arrived, <coughs> Eli was sitting on a seat by the wayside that he was watching. And it says here, for his heart trembled for the ark of the Lord. Pretty interesting there. That tells us a couple of different things. First, that tells us that he was never instructed by the Lord to take the ark out. I don't know if you guys ever done something you know you shouldn't have done and you're hoping for the best. You're hoping that it doesn't come back and bite you in the behind. I don't know if you guys ever done that. I mean, again, I'm talking to holy people here. I forgot. I mean, <laughs> right? We, we've done things where we're thinking, I hope they don't find out or I hope it doesn't come back and bite me. I, you know, we start thinking this is what, he, and this was the ark of God. Again, another indicator they were using this as a gimmick without permission in a sense. And he was sitting. And what's interesting is that this is kind of the second time that we see Eli sitting because in, in verse, uh, verse Samuel, first Samuel chapter one, verse nine, we saw him. And he was also sitting. Back then, he was referenced as Eli the priest. Remember with me, he was the one that was sitting by the door of the tabernacle. And he was the one that was making sure that when people would go in and worship the Lord, that their hearts were right. He was considered Eli the priest. He was sitting. Now, he's sitting. And look what it says here. Just calls him Eli. Interesting. You know, men, when we begin to distance ourselves from God, our identity in God begin, becomes affected. When we looked at Samuel when he was born, the Bible was telling us that he lay before the Ark of the Covenant. He was in close proximity to God. Here, we see Eli, the priest of of Shiloh. He has distanced himself from the Lord. 
He hasn't called upon the Lord. He's making decisions that are not coming from the Lord. And now his identity and who he is is not even mentioned. And it's a good reminder for us men that when we begin to distance ourselves from the Lord, or we allow different things of that, 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 that is that when we worship God, and I don't mean worship him in song, when our lives demonstrate a, a lifestyle of worship to the Lord, we're in his word, we're coming to church, we're in prayer, we're in fellowship, that, that is part of worship in the Lord. And, and a lot of times we begin to identify ourselves in that, which is a great thing. We begin to identify ourselves as Christian men of God. And this is what this world needs today, are men of God that are in Christ, that are strong, that will stand up for truth. But oftentimes we allow things to get in the way of our relationship with Christ. And we begin to distance ourselves from God. And when we begin to distance ourselves from God, eventually we begin to lose our identity in Christ. The perfect example of this is when Peter, when Jesus was being taken from Caiaphas to, he was going to be taken to all these different places. And the Bible tells us that Peter distanced himself. He followed at a distance, right? And ultimately, what did Peter end up doing? He denied Jesus three times. So when we allow things in our walk, men, to get in the way in proximity between us and our relationship with Christ, if we allow those things, we will eventually lose our identity in Christ. This is why it's so important, men, that we come to Tuesday mornings, that you give John money. <laughs> see if you guys are awake. Just see if you're awake. You guys are. It's important, especially if we're married, especially if we have children. We need to stay close to Jesus, men. Let alone being a man today, we need to stay close to Jesus. And what's interesting here is Eli, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 9, he was sitting, but he was considered Eli the priest. Here, he's sitting. He's not longer, he's not even at the temple. What happened? He's not even at the house of God. He's not even where he needs to be. He's not carrying out his role. It tells us here that he's sitting, that he's sitting on the wayside. He's sitting in a seat by the wayside. It's tragic when we see men, men of God, who were sitting in the temple or in the, in the congregation of God, sitting among us brothers sitting at church, sitting, doing the work for the Lord and, and, and have allowed distance to get in between, allow different things and now are sitting by the wayside. We already know that Samuel was old and his eyesight was fading. When you look at 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22, it tells us that his eyes were growing dim. So it's no surprise to see him sitting now and waiting. It's a little surprising that he's not by the by the by the tabernacle, but it makes sense if the ark of God is out. I'm sure he's going to be wanting to see where it's at. He's not capable of doing much more. See, men, when we are cast away on the wayside, there's really not much for us to do. And this is why the enemy is at work 24-7, trying to distract you from the things of the Lord so you can be on the sidelines. He uses fear anxiety, depression, to cause a, a spiritual paralysis in our lives that makes us ineffective for the kingdom and we're kind of cast on the wayside. This is why, again, men, it's so important that we stay in God's word. It's so important. We're not going to be able to make it if we're not in God's word or in prayer. But when we look about where Eli is sitting in verse 13, it's a little difficult to translate. Because it's not clear when you look at verse 13 where this wayside was at. Some commentators point out that he could have been seated by the road or Eli could have been sitting by a gate, which would make sense because he was a priest 
being able to watch the road. One commentator even points out that Eli may have been seated on top of a gate, which would be considered a city gate. Now, if you've ever been to Israel, you'll, you'll see that these communities or these cities that are being excavated, or you'll, you'll notice that the tour guide will say, this is the city gate. And that's important because we see throughout the Old Testament is this is where the elders would come together and handle their business. They would talk about <clears throat> city things. They would, they would carry out city functions. They would make pronouncements on judgments. They would, they would do their work there at the city gate. It's where the, all, all the elders would meet. And they would discuss city business. So some point out that he may have been on a city gate watching and was able to be elevated a little bit. Now a little bit. Because the Bible said he was old and he was heavy. So he probably couldn't get too high up. But it was enough for him to be to see the road. And what's interesting here in verse 13. This verse is underlined by a detail that is a little unusual in the Bible. But it's interesting. In biblical narratives, not in the Bible, but in, in, in narratives when there is a story being told, it, it, it's given us insight to his emotional state. We see this when King David is crying out to the Lord, saying that my sin is ever before me. We see that in a narrative in the book of Psalms. And here we, we get a good look into his emotional state in verse 13 because it says here, for his heart trembled before the ark of the Lord. That word trembled there is interesting. It literally means that he shook with anxiety. I don't know if you guys have ever been in that place before. I remember running from the cops. So I mean, obviously I didn't run. <laughs> Hiding from the cops. And I would literally be so scared and nervous. Or wait, anticipating me getting busted or, or, but I don't know if you guys have ever been to a point where you've sh literally trembled in anxiety. You shook with anxiety. What was it about the ark that made Eli's heart tremble? tremble? After all, the Philistines had been terrified at the news of the ark coming into the Israelite camp, according to chapter four, verse seven. What did Eli know that the Philistines didn't know about the ark. Remember, the Israelites shouted with joy and confidence as the ark arrived into the camp, chapter 4, verse 5. But why did Eli's heart tremble? Why was his heart shaken with anxiety? What did Eli know that the Israelites didn't know? We know now that both the Philistines and the Israelites were mistaken but that news has not yet reached Eli. What Eli knew, what, that God had promised his two sons were going to die on the same day, he knew that. He knew that the Ark of the Covenant was going to be captured. He was told clearly. I think that he was anxious for the Ark in some ways, but I think he was more terrified that the ark was going to be captured. Because if the ark is captured, the presence of the Lord is no longer there. So why was he so nervous? Because Eli knew that he had let the ark go on an unwise, superstitious errand, and his conscience made him fear that it would end in disaster. And it does. When you look at the second part of verse 13, it says, and when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. For a moment, now we leave Eli in his seat and we come back to the man that is bringing the bad news and it tells us that he comes and he passes Eli up and he runs right into the city of Shiloh and tells them first. Another insight to Eli no longer being the priest. Yes, he was appeared as a priest, but his duties as a priest, this man rode, ran right by him. And it tells us that in the end of verse 13, when the man came into the city, he told it with all the city and cried out, if Eli's sitting at the gate or in a road that's watching, this man just literally ran past him. 
So now the writer's taking us back to the, the man that's coming for the bad news. He tells us here that he ran right, seems to run right past the old man Eli into the city where he tells the news. And it says in, again, and when the man came into the city and told the news, all the city cried out. Now, what's interesting about this? Weren't they just shouting just not too long ago when the ark came in? And now they're crying out. A result when we think we can use gimmicks to fight our battles. We will have this excitement, but ultimately we will be crying out. And it reminds us, remember, that they had this shout. Just as this man probably really didn't need to speak, his appearance told it all. We really don't even know, really need to hear what he said because we already know what he's going to say. But again, we are told that the whole city cried out. It wasn't just a few people. This is the entire city as they're waiting in anticipation of what's going on with the ark. Remind us that just not too long ago, in chapter 4, verse 5, that all Israel again shouted when the Ark of the Covenant came into the city, to the camp. This time, the cry has a different tone. You know what's interesting about this cry out? There, there are so many different levels of grief here. If you think about it, if you put yourself in the shoes of one of those who were the ones that were there shouting out when the Ark of the Covenant came into the camp and, and now you're crying out because everything is being pulled out from underneath you, imagine for the moment the emotions of that, the grief that comes with that. You know, many homes suffered the loss of sons, husbands, fathers, Brothers, there was a crisis of leadership. Now there's going to be a domination and a exploitation of the Philistines. But the loss that weighs more heavier than all of those layers of grief would be the loss of the ark. And this loss of the ark could probably raise some very disturbing religious questions. Does this mean that God has lost his power to deliver his people? A religious question. A religious question that's built on a religious solution. What had Israel done to merit such disaster? Lord, why, did, why am I going through this? How could this ever happen to chosen people? This was, again, the agenda of much of the people of the elders because they're the ones that came up with the solution to bring the ark in. They're using these questions again now in their many layers of grief. What's interesting here is that they still don't understand that this is God's judgment on the covenant he had with the people. But all of these combined could not equal the impact of the Benjamite who ran and brought news into the city. What's interesting, when you look at Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5, it says, look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you will not believe, though it were told to you. So when we look at verse 14, it tells us, when Eli heard the noise of the outcry and he said, what does the son of this tumult mean? And the, men came, the man came and quickly told Eli, and Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were so dim that he could not see. Then the man said to Eli, I am he who came from this battle, and I fled today from the battle line. And he said, what happened, my son? As the cry from the city rang out, the people are crying out now. Now the story of the writers get tearing us back to the man, Eli, sitting on the chair. And it tells us in verse 14 that when he heard the cry, He asked, what is this uproar? What does this tumult mean? He didn't have to wait long because it says the man came quickly in verse 14 
The man came quickly and told Eli. And in verse 15, before we hear what the man said to Eli, once again, the writer wants to give us an update, a reminder of Eli's frailty. He's old and he can't see. He's 98 years old, according to verse 15, and his eyes were so dim or so set that he could not even see. He's blind. We first heard of this in chapter 3, verse 2, and so since then, it says his eyes were growing dim. He is now blind. Some time has passed. Now he's completely blind. And what's interesting here, it's a little sad, but what's interesting here, that when you look at verse 13, I just want to point something out. It tells us that his heart trembled for the ark of God because, I'm sorry, a little before that. Eli sitting on the seat by the wayside. What does it say that he was doing? Watching. Wait a minute, this dude's blind. How could he be watching? This is why he had not drawn the obvious conclusion from the appearance of the man who must have run right past him. There, it, the, there's no indication that Eli saw him because he ran right past him. He said, hey, hey, hey. he was so mindful, remember with me, when he, when Hannah went into the tabernacle for prayer, he was mindful to stop her and say, are you drunk? So it's a good indication that he was blind because this man right, ran by, this Benjamite ran right past him and he didn't even notice him. Or if he would have, he would have stopped him. Weak, blind, trembling old Eli, Israel's leader, he needed to ask, what is this uproar? Weak, blind, and trembling is a result of being distanced from God. The stark contrast of being distanced from God and being weak, blind, and trembling, we see the contrast in chapter 3, verse 10, where, where uh, with Samuel, where the Lord came and stood, came and called. There's a contrast between close proximity to God and distance from God. Where are we today, then? Are we in close proximity where God can stand before us in his presence, we're in his presence. He comes to us and he calls us. Or are we weak, blind, and trembling? Because if we are, that is a good indicator that your proximity with Christ has been distance. Something has gotten in the way between your fellowship with you and your fellowship with Christ. Psalm 145, 18 to 20 says, The Lord is near all those who call upon him. To all who call upon him in truth, he will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. So when we look at verses 16 and 17, this man, of, this man from of Benjamin says to Eli, I'm the one who's come from battle. I was in the battle line. I was in the front lines. I was in the heat of battle. And, and in verse 16, Eli says, well, what happened, my son? And in verse 17, we see a progression of the man's news that gets worse and worse and worse. Verse 17, it tells us, Israel fled before the Philistines. Then there was a great slaughter among the people, 30,000. Also, want more bad news? Your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead. Also, the ark of the God, the ark of God has been captured. That progression, the progression of the news grows worse and worse. And in verse eighteen, it says, "When when he had made mention of the ark, he didn't. It wasn't when he mentioned his two sons, or that Israel was in, uh, has Israel has fled, or any of the bad news that was mentioned. It was the news of the ark." of God had been captured. It tells us that he, uh, Eli fell off his seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck was broken and he died. Some commentators point out he might have had a stroke, might have had a heart attack, 
but whatever it was, at the news of the ark being captured, he fell backwards and died. That's interesting. Because here in a few moments, we're going to see his daughter-in-law, when heard that the ark of the covenant was captured, she gave birth and died. Later on, when somebody touches the ark of the covenant in an unworthy way, or struck killed. Interesting that the use of a gimmick has been fatal for them. The writer doesn't tell us that it was the news. The writer, I'm sorry, the writer tells us that it was the news that had been taken that Eli fell backwards. This is kind of a, a, a strange expression. I don't mean strange in a weird way. It just tells us that it was the mention of the ark itself. This confirmed Eli's great fear. Why, why did he have so much anxiety? Because he was afraid of this and it happened. The, the God of the covenant whose ark it was had dealt with Eli's son and they died. And it's interesting that verse 18 closes with a weird, not a weird verse, but something interesting because it says, and Eli judged Israel for 40 years. Now, Eli was never a judge. He was a priest. Nowhere in the Bible does it tell us that he, he was ever called a judge. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that he judged Israel. Israel's past experience of judges can be summed up in, 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 a, in a verse that you find in Judges chapter 2, verse 18, when it talked about a judge delivering Israel. It says, whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. But he is not referencing him as a judge. In reality, Eli did not judge Israel. Is that Eli brought judgment to Israel because of his corruption and his disobedience. So when you read that in the original language, it's not referencing him as a good thing he's done. It's referencing that his judgment, because of his corruption, was brought against Israel. And so after 40 years of leadership, Israel has now suffered a crushing defeat. For the first time ever, the Ark of God had been taken from them and this is the kind of judge that Israel can do without. Now, really briefly, because we're wrapping up in time, the scene now changes. It, it comes from a public visible view of what we've been looking at. It's been a public, you know, the, 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 the battle, the gate, all that's in, in public view. But, but now we're going to now turn, turn to a scene that's more private where we will see another tragedy and hear of a deeper insight to what had happened. So now we are taken into a home in Shiloh where the wife of Phineas, remember Phineas is one of the corrupt sons of Eli. And this wife is at the point of giving birth. And this is what it tells us in verse 19. Now his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child and was due to be delivered. Now, when she heard of the news of the ark was captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself, gave birth, and her labor pains came upon her. And about that time of her death, the woman who stood by her like midwife said to her, don't fear, you have born a son. But she did not answer, nor did she regard it. Then she named the child Ichabod saying that the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God has been captured in because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said the glory of the glory departed from Israel and the ark has been captured. So right before she's going to give birth, she learns that the ark is captured. She now has labor pains. She gives birth. And right when she gives birth, she names the child. The glory has departed, Ichabod or Ichabod. And she dies. She had heard uh, the headline news was the ark was captured. Eli died. Her husband died. And it seemed like the news came closer and closer and closer to home. And it says in verse 19, when she heard the news, pregnant, she heard the death of her husband, 
her brother-in-law, her father-in-law, a slaughter among the soldiers of Israel, a lost battle, a the ark captured all in one day. This anguish was so great, and Bible tells us that labor pains came upon her. Talking about trembling with anxiety. Now the women, a pregnant woman is now described as labor pains came upon her. This is why I thank the Lord I'm not a woman. We don't ever have to go through labor pains. But this shock brought on labor to her. And it says she bowed and gave birth for her pains came upon her. Terrible, terrible story, right? So many deaths. We see a new life, Ichabod. But this new life was accompanied by yet another death. His mother died. And this woman attending, this midwife trying to comfort her, didn't even bother her because she said she didn't even answer or pay attention to the birth. The earlier news was too much. And now the glory has been gone. Ichabod, the name Ichabod literally means, where's the glory? Or glory has departed. What a different view from Hannah's prayer for a birth of a son, of her child, to this mother now crying out, says, where's the glory? <clears throat> What's interesting here is, and I want to close with this, it tells us that Eli was heavy. Now, when you look at the Hebrew word, uh, the Hebrew word is kabed, from the word kabad, which means glory. Eli had been the kabad of Israel. He was the priest, the teacher, the mediator. He was the, repre the, repre the representative of, of God in a lot of ways. But the glory of Eli had become no more than his fatness. Because now he's referenced as kabed versus kabad. And it had to do with his corruption. It had to do why he was fat. A lot of the commentaries say he was heavy because remember they were putting their prongs in, taking out what they wanted before the, offer, the sacrifice was being offered. They were ripping off God. And his glory is now described as being heavy. Another indicator that there is distance created between him and God. And when there's distance created between us and the Lord, eventually his presence will leave our lives. What a horrible place to be. Man, we're to be in God's word. We're to stay in prayer. We are the delight of the Lord. And we're to live in such a way that we bring glory and honor to the Lord. That means we're to be in close proximity to our Lord. That means we're to be in prayer and, and in God's word. And now where is this glory? Dead by some wayside on the road. Doesn't even tell us he was buried. These tragic events that began with corruption Seeking themselves instead of seeking the Lord, the presence of the Lord departed. Men, may we always be men that carry the presence of the Lord in our lives. May we always demonstrate the love of Jesus Christ. May we always uh, demonstrate God's grace, mercy in our lives. May we be men of God of these last days that stand up and speak for truth, that we are obedient to God's word. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. And Lord, there's a lot of things we can glean from this. So Lord, I ask that your word would remain steadfast in our lives. And Lord, I lift up these men before you. I pray that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit. And Lord, that we will not create distance between us and you. It's us that creates the distance. And Lord, I just ask that those things that would cause distance between us, Lord, we, we would remove them. And that we would always draw near to you, Lord. That is your desire, is to love us and to use us in a mighty way. So, Lord, I lift up these men before you. I pray that you would fill them with your spirit again. And so, Lord, I pray for the brothers online. 
And Lord, through their bunny slippers, fill them with your spirit, Lord. And so, Lord, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. And God bless. Oh, Andy's in the back for men's conference tickets. And then they're bringing out the burritos right now. God bless you guys. Thank you guys for watching online. The applauding, rambunctious, tumultuous clap and thunder.